Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today we are going to talk about trust, uh, which is really bedrock in human development for an infant It is the very first task in life from birth until about 18 months old. According to Eric Erickson, who developed all kinds of stages of life, and he was the first one to to do that through the whole course of uh, human lifespan. But we start with trust. The baby has to believe that the caregivers will be responsive that the world is safe, that his or her needs will be met. And those needs are affection, comfort, and feeding. When I'm hungry, will I be fed? And this is foundational to human development. And of course, it has uh, reverberations all through life. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So we're starting from this place where trust is something that we enter early adulthood with or without, depending on our early childhood experiences. And then that can influence an innumerable number of factors otherwise. Do we trust our boss? Do we trust the person we're dating? Do we trust our neighbor, for that matter? And depending on the lens we're looking through, The world can often reflect back to us what our expectations are. I've always found this really interesting, that if one emanates a feeling of trust, it tends to constellate a certain field around them. And there's characters in movies and even cartoons where the trusting one somehow manages to have things work out. I don't know if you guys remember those old cartoons, Mr. Magoo. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh, yes. Yeah, that's great. He was an, an old fellow who had this extreme nearsightedness. And so much of the cartoon was him walking across the street, and then all of a sudden uh, he would turn left, and he would step onto a car, and then the car would drive a, f- uh, a few feet, and then he'd step off onto a construction beam, and then happily walk across the beam that would then swing in a certain direction and then drop him off in a building. And all of these kind of absurd accommodations that the world would make to keep him safe, because Mm -hmm. in a sense, he was an innocent soul. So I think that archetype moves around in the collective. Yeah, I I, I love that you took it there, Joseph. And I would say that we are in the archetype of the good mother. And that when we have a positive mother complex that is the experience of trust in the world. And, you know, being cared for adequately as an infant installs a sense of profound trust in the world. 
so that as we go through life, we expect that most people will like us. We have faith that things will go our way, at least part of the time. And we have a kind of foundational belief in our own basic okayness and enoughness. You know, it's as if we can take for granted that the ground is going to hold us up. And this kind of trust is the gift of a positive mother complex. And you're right, it does develop a field around us so that we more or less feel the world rising up to meet us as we move forward. And holding those positive and confident expectations changes all of these tiny signals that we give to other people and to the world in general. Conversely, if we feel that the world is dangerous, out to get us, untrustworthy, we also signal that to people and circumstances, and then we're met differently. It really is sort of a corollary of uh, self-fulfilling prophecies uh, that are positive and negative expectations. We kind of co-create some of that, and mostly we get back what we put out. And on the other hand, there is misplaced trust where maybe we haven't been vigilant enough or canny enough or clear-sighted enough. So we, we can't grow up being like Mr. Magoo. Yeah, trust, I think, could be an initial attitude that we bring to a situation, but we also have to be attentive to the reality of things as they unfold. And sometimes withdrawing trust, excuse me, Paul, let me try that again. Sometimes withdrawing trust is the correct attitude. Talking about having this basic sense of trust and going out into the world with it, you know, another archetypal version of Mr. Magoo is the Tarot image of the fool. And trust is part of that symbology of that image, is that we are making our way in the world and we have this sense of trust. You know, in much of the imagery around that card, this young man is kind of stepping off, not looking where he's going. And the card carries both that sense that we meet the world with a sense of trust and that we are being foolish and perhaps have misplaced trust. It can it can mean either thing, but I think fundamentally, most primarily, in my understanding, that card speaks to that basic sense of trust with which we hopefully begin life. So maybe what we're uh, doing here is, is distinguishing trust as a basic optimism, but one that is not necessarily synonymous with innocence or, or gullibility in some unaware place. So yes, we're aware uh, and yes, we basically believe that the world will welcome us, that there are good places out there for us, that people are basically well-intentioned, and we have sufficiently well-developed antenna to sense when something isn't right as well. But there are overall narrative about life, our attitude and stance is positive rather than fearful. So we have this ideally, adequate childhood foundation to move into the world and to expect that other people are going to be fundamentally trustworthy, which means they're going to be fundamentally reliable. They're going to fundamentally have integrity. They're fundamentally going to fulfill their agreements with us. And then occasionally we discover that that trust was misplaced and people have failed us. And we can react to that in a lot of different ways. What I'm also wondering about is how trust and mistrust are kind of shadow and ego dynamics. So when we come into a situation and we consistently extend trust somewhere in the unconscious, mistrust is born, a nodal point in the shadow. 
So we have the distrusting, perhaps even trickster shadow figure. And then we have the trusting, I don't want to say child, it's not always true, but the trusting ego state that is moving into the situations. And both of them are kind of pinging the environment a little bit. When we're betrayed, we often project our own shadow trickster onto those other people, which makes it all rather difficult. But I'm thinking that if that basic sense of trust has been established and we have had experiences where it was safe to be vulnerable, then when uh, something happens that lets us down, we can be disappointed uh, rather than feel betrayed. And if we're disappointed, that's a feeling of, oh, gee, you know, so-and-so didn't show up. I feel really awful. But we can also then extend some basic belief in the goodness of the other. Well, there's the basis for repair. Exactly. For, versus when we feel betrayed, the underlying narrative is often so-and-so is a no-good Nick. I shouldn't have trusted him. So the basic trust gives us access just to a feeling state of disappointment, which is very different from betrayal. Well, Deb, I mean, I think you're lifting up something really interesting. Obviously, there are times when we trust someone and our trust is profoundly betrayed. Yes. And and it, it can actually kind of shift your whole worldview. I mean, I'm thinking about people who invested their life savings with Bernie Madoff. Then when you realize that your trust was betrayed, you you may have a profound shift in attitude. It may really shape how you relate to the world. But you're you're really on to something with this idea that with maybe more minor betrayals, there's been a break, there's been a breach in understanding, and the basic trust that we have underlying our relationship with one another facilitates a repair in that moment. I think that this distinction uh, that you're making between sort of having that basic trust and not to my mind, it applies a great deal to certain psychotherapeutic situations. I mean, if you're sitting with someone who does have that basic trust, there will undoubtedly be times when I say something that was flat-footed or was wrong, or I, I got something wrong, or I, I didn't answer the phone call, or I didn't answer the phone call quickly enough. And People can feel really let down and angry and disappointed. And, you know, most of the time I think come back and tell me about it and I can feel remorse and, and share that with the person and we can have a repair. But sometimes there are people who enter analysis who don't have that. And it sets up a very different kind of dynamic. It's the difference between a basic assumption of the other person's goodness or not? And can we give that other person, let's say your example, the analyst, can we give the analyst the benefit of the doubt that after all, uh, you're human, I'm human, we're all human. Sometimes we have a bad day or we say something that's awkward or just lands utterly wrong. And with basic trust, uh, you know, there can be a repair there and there can be a belief that this person does care and and will engage in the repair versus if that basic trust is missing, we can be perceived as persecutory and even, you know, really cruel. And I, I am thinking about clients that I've had who often tell the stories about being so scared that they hid under the bed or dived into the closet, you know, or had a special refuge somewhere, you know, uh, under the branches of a special tree. When that comes up, the vulnerability comes up for the first time uh, in the initial period of working together. Whether that person feels deeply understood empathized with, related to, cared about in that moment of awful childhood vulnerability, 
or whether being seen in that way is profoundly shaming and perceived as damaging. And I've had it happen both ways. Fortunately, most of the time, it it continues to build trust and that it is safe to be vulnerable. Yeah, I I know just what you're talking about, Deb. I've I've experienced that as well. And when that uh, basic trust isn't there, it can be it can create a chasm that is very difficult to cross. It's a profoundly sad uh, situation when that happens, um, unless a repair can be made. As I've felt a couple of times that that person was relegated uh, to a kind of loneliness that is incredibly painful, even in this moment, to be thinking about. I'm also wanting maybe to um, take a step out of this very early developmental place and just think about how trust is fundamental all over the place. It's fundamental in marriages and other intimate relationships. It's fundamental in in the workplace and those relationships. And of course, we see it, I think, all over the place in public life. Of Is basic trust there uh, for all kinds of systems, educational systems, the healthcare system, uh, government, and I think we are profoundly experiencing a lack of trust in basic honesty and information systems, agencies, et cetera. Well, you're talking about trusting institutions. Mm-hmm. And we are in a phase where there has been a real erosion of trust in institutions. And the difficulty in a great measure is how the distrust has been fomented by bad actors. And then we're in the realm of slander and distortion and manipulation of our ability to trust. I mean, there was a time where parents trusted their teachers and they trusted their children to the process of education. And now through a a kind of a concerted smear campaign, teachers have become objects of distrust and scorn. We no longer seem to trust any politician. We don't trust our news agencies. We're more likely to trust a kind of YouTube algorithm Mm -hmm. because it's self-affirming. So when trust begins to erode the fabric of a family, a relationship, or a society, that the civilization itself begins to shake and erode because so much of being in a communal situation is based on some fundamental trust. Yeah. It is really the cornerstone of human relationships at every level. And I think it comes down to the feeling that somebody cares You know, whether it's an advertiser hawking somewhere, do they care that my experience with that product or service uh, will be as promised? Uh, Does my partner care? Do my colleagues care about the impact on me of any kind of transaction, interaction, or implicit social contract? that the company that I work for cares enough about me not to just, um, you know, have a, a sudden series of layoffs. Caring, as it turns out, is part of that cor- cornerstone. And I wonder in today's world, with so much that is commodified, transactional, and unrelated, Uh, if we need to put that back into the equation. And that's a tall order. (laughs) This question of, you know, what factors need to be adequately in place in order to constellate a feeling of trust that's based in reality and not just a kind of pipe dream. Yeah. I'm thinking a little bit about 
some work that uh, Benet Brown has done around trust, and she has a list or an inventory of qualities that seem to bring trust forward. She claims that when there are adequate boundaries, reliability, accountability, integrity, non-judgment, generosity, and an ability to hold what is private carefully and fully. And she calls that ability the vault. To feel like when your friend gives you really sensitive information, you put it into an internal vault where it is safe and locked away. So I think that those qualities make sense to me. I think they're also values that would improve probably most relationships in part or magnificently. But those are values that one can decide to cultivate to be able to contribute to the general atmosphere of trust that's around us. You know, I'm thinking about that in a couple of different directions. One, one is that I remember uh, listening to an analysis of the housing market crash. And one of the points that was made was that it was obviously contributed to by the buying and selling of all of these kinds of crazy mortgage products. So debt would be purchased and bundled and then someone else would buy it. And so in other words, you didn't know the person that you actually owed money to for your house, which contributed the sense that people could just default on these mortgages. It's very different from the way that we might have bought a house 50, 60 years ago when you went down to the local bank and you got a loan there. Financially, it might look pretty much the same, but it was surrounded by a web of relationships. So that if you defaulted on your mortgage, your friend who worked down at the bank would know about it. There was a sense of being knitted into a community that heightened a sense of trust. And I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. This is, I'm sort of out of my depth in this field of economics, but I, but I think there's something there. And, and the other thing I want to say, Joseph, is, is to your list of, of qualities, I, I think that's helpful. And I'm, I mean, I've certainly worked with, you know, multiple people over the course of my career who are in relationships where either they cannot be trusted or they cannot trust their partner. And it might be, you know, obviously big things like cheating on one another, but, but it can also be smaller things like I just have trouble, um, doing what I say I'm going to do, that I promise that I'm going to do something and then I don't do it. Or my partner, you know, will will lie to me about, about you know, minor things and big things, but, but that I'm always catching her in a lie. And, and what do we do in a case like that in an interpersonal relationship that's so important where we just can't maintain a feeling of trust? Well, that that really goes right back to um, that very helpful list that you generated, um, Joseph, of reliability. Can I rely on you just to do what you said you were going to do? And also, can I hold you accountable? And will you be held accountable? Uh, which for me brings in um, guilt. That when we have a relationship with someone we can name, whether it's our, our mortgage guy at the bank or uh, the next door neighbor or a partner, that we're going to feel guilty if we let that person down. You know, even if I'm the, the mortgage guy at the bank, you know, and somebody can't make the payment that month, I'm going to feel really guilty if I can't cut them a break. Whereas when we get great big systems where things are anonymous, it's much harder to hold people accountable or for people to feel uh, that they must be reliable because there's no relationship. And that goes back to, does somebody care? Do you, big government system or uh, intimate partner, do you care? And I think feeling guilty is um, a good 
uh, sort of hedge against taking advantage and being responsible for upholding trust. I think it's one of those super ego qualities that we need in order to keep the fabric of the civilization intact, that we all internalize some kind of ethical framework and that there's a part of the psyche that sends off a little alarm when we're deviating too far. So when we begin to move towards behavior that's going to violate trust, ideally, an alarm would sound inside of our heads. As you said, Deb, this feeling that I'm going to feel really guilty about that, that my own psyche is going to punish me, in a sense, if I take this step. And that can cause us to at least pause and think before we act impulsively in a way that's going to change the fabric of a relationship. I think our closeness or distance uh, in, in transactional or other interactional relationships makes a huge difference. I know when uh, we lived in New York, I, I saw stuff on the subway that was just absolutely outrageous. Because it was very anonymous, all strangers, um, you know, that person was not going to be held accountable for his or her behavior. Then we moved to Cape Cod, and it's a much smaller community. And there is that sense of, you know, if somebody does something really rude and outrageous in a store, you'll be held accountable for it. People are going to know who you are. And that may not come from particularly elevated moral structures, uh, but there is some sense there around being held accountable that helps to maintain a social fabric of, of harmony that people can trust in. Well, I think accountability is absolutely part of the field of trust. I, I want to move this into more of an intrapsychic realm for a minute. And I'm thinking about how there's a relationship between our ability to trust ourselves and the world and the connection that we may have with our bodies. And Marion Woodman has written about this. She has a couple quotes I want to share. She says, a body whose wisdom has never been honored will not easily trust. And it brings up this image, which I think is absolutely accurate, of trust being something that is very primal. You know, we don't make a decision to trust. It really is happening down almost at a cellular level, which brings us back, by the way, to the early developmental stuff that we started with, that we can feel in our bodies whether the environment feels safe, whether the relationship feels safe. And if we don't have that experience of of trusting our bodies or or our bodies feeling trusted then uh, that makes these further relationships more difficult here's another uh, marian woodman quote she says unless the body knows it is loved that its responses are acceptable the psyche does not have the ground of certainty in the instincts that it requires Sooner or later in the analysis, the person will become stuck because the ego is afraid to trust. At the point of surrender, the ego becomes paralyzed. Unless the body knows that there are inner loving arms strong enough to contain it, however fierce or broken it may be, it will hang on to its own rigidity in an effort to survive. The, the wisdom in what Woodman is saying here, I think, is that trust is so fundamental in terms even of our ability to have a trusting relationship within ourselves. Can we trust our instincts? Can we trust our body? That's where it all starts. And of course, we do learn that in this early, early stage of life and it's mediated by our primary caregiver. What I'm thinking about here is the relationship between trust 
and early trauma. Trauma that is not remembered in a conscious or cognitive way because its way precedes any kind of verbal or or cognitive capability. And we also know that it is related to brain development. And, you know, what Marion Woodman is touching on, and you are, Lisa, it is basic early bodily uh, brainstem experiences that are foundational to emotional and then later cognitive development. And I always think we should be shouting from the rooftops about this, of the importance of reliable, safe care for infants with caregivers. That good start in life is, it just cannot be overvalued or overestimated. But you don't have to be perfect. Oh, <laughs> there very few of us <laughs> as mothers have ever even dreamt of being perfect. I'm thinking of another phenomena of having that early trust violated is that often when a child has been in a dangerous environment, they can also develop a kind of permissive trust that leaves them vulnerable to danger. Just as you were saying, trust in one's instincts can be violated, particularly when we're raised in an environment where our own instincts are dismissed, they're not real, they're even attacked, that the only thing that one is able to express is what the caregivers deem important or valid. Some children will then shut down that whole instinctive side of themselves, and they'll walk up to strangers and bestow a level of trust upon them because their own instinct for self-preservation has been violated. And uh, gosh, I remember when I was particularly in my social work training, you know, stories about small children, you know, five-year-old kids will, you know, just kind of walk up to a stranger and take their hand and, you know, walk down the street with them without any sense that this might put them in danger. I remember one story. I was working uh, with an agency that d dealt with um, children that were in temporary foster care. One of the kids was probably between five and six years old, and the child was raised in a very bad circumstance, again, had this permissive trust, and had been able to convince a stranger to take him to an airport was wandering around the airport and actually was able to negotiate with a stranger to buy him a ticket to another city and then to go and get on the plane. So this really extraordinary lack of fear that the child experienced and a kind of intuition about how to manipulate the trust of other people seem to rise up out of this substantial trauma history. So we're in the realm of attachment theory. Mm -hmm. And when we have a healthy attachment, appropriate trust is a major part of that. And I think you're also illustrating what dissociation can look like of uh, that, you know, this particular young person operating like an automaton, uh, utterly disconnected uh, from his own feelings, a uh, sense of danger, but almost robotically engaging in this kind of, of activation. And so permissive trust, another way of framing it, is a kind of dissociation. Uh, the instincts that would normally chime in are put to sleep. Also, there's a very young psyche, so there's no way even for the ego to develop a sense of the values that should be present between me and the other in order to extend. But the solution is when we find ourselves 
more awake, older, in early adulthood perhaps, is to name, cultivate an understanding of the values that will keep us safe and to believe in them. So we have to reparent ourselves in order to be able to move through the world with some sense of discrimination. It will never be as instinctive, I think, as it might have been had we been raised differently. But we can patch up our evaluative process and bestow trust or withhold trust based on a thinking process. That we can repair uh, early deficits in attachment, trust, and kind of get to a place where we can earn security, a basic sense of security, uh, that we are okay, that other people are not uh, out to get us. Uh, we can give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, acknowledge somebody else's perspective instead of just thinking from that self-centered place of what happened to me, what might happen to me, and attune to other people's uh, emotions so that we can, we can repair those places. It's, well, of course, it's the work of psychotherapy in, in many, many cases that you can have now and work toward now what you did not have at a younger stage, it's not too late. I, I'm thinking that we've been talking about trusting our instincts and how that can be very dependent upon what we're taught as children. Are we taught to trust our instincts or are we taught to violate the trust in instincts? Talking about trusting ourselves and then there's something moving into the transpersonal or archetypal realm about trusting God, trusting the universe, if you will, or trusting the unconscious. And obviously having trust in God is a major aspect of many uh, religious beliefs, that that is absolutely essential that one trusts in God. Uh, but when we look at it psychologically, we can see that uh, to live a healthy life, we have to have a certain kind of trust in the unconscious. And uh, this comes up in archetypal materials such as fairy tales. I mean, there's so many motifs of this. I mean, I just could probably enumerate, you know, 25 or something. But just off the top of my head, I'm thinking, for example, in the fairy tale Puss in Boots, uh, Miller has died and he's he has three sons and he's left, he doesn't have much, but he's left what he has to his son. So he gets his first son, the mill and his second son, he gives him, you know, a bag of gold or something. And the third son, all he has left is this cat. And this cat walks around in a pair of boots and it's puss in boots. And this cat talks and the cat speaks to the youngest son and tells him to do all kinds of things. Like for example, one day he says, take your clothes off and get in the ditch. And the, the man does it. He does whatever the cat tells him to do. He trusts the cat. And of course, the cat is very wise and very uh, has a wonderful uh, access to trickster energy. And so the man is lying in the ditch and, and the king's carriage is coming by. And the cat says, you know, yell out, help, help. And so the man does and the king stops his carriage and he says, who are you? And the cat instructs him to say, well, I'm, I'm the Duke of Carabas or something. And I've been uh, robbed and thrown in this ditch. So the king takes him inside his carriage and uh, gives him a fine suit of clothing. And, and in this way, you know, the story continues. And the, the young man, the miller's youngest son, winds up married to the, the princess. But, but there's another very touching fairy tale image that I wanted to share. Again, lots and lots of examples of it. This one comes from a tale from the American South called The Talking Eggs, which is a version of, I think the, the fairy tale is called uh, Diamonds and Pearls. It's, it's a French fairy tale. And uh, in it, a young girl has followed a strange old woman back to her house. And the woman does all kinds of weird things, like takes her head off her shoulders in order to comb her hair and and the little girl is just sort of looking on. You know, the woman has said, don't, don't be alarmed by anything that you see. 
And then the old woman gives uh, the little girl an old beef bone and says, put this in the pot for supper. And the, and the, the young girl says, shall I, shall I boil it for soup? You know, but she's a little skeptical because she's starving and this is just an old bone. And the old woman says, look at the pot. And the pot is filled with a thick bubbling stew. So it's the sense that even though it looks like things are not going our way from the ego perspective, if we have that relationship with the unconscious, if we can trust in the unconscious, it will deliver up its gifts most generously. Lisa, those uh, fairy tales, both of them, are so poignant and uh, strike such a note of, of hope and basic welcome from the unconscious. Uh, I almost hesitate to add, uh, you know, sort of the flip side, the underbelly, as it were, that oftentimes uh, when there has been a history of relational trauma, which I think so many people can relate to, that what will come up first is not a wonderful, rich, bubbling stew on the stove, but people will encounter shadow uh, in the form of of nightmares, um, memories, feeling states, lots of other things that are can be hard to bear, and yet that truth of the pot of bubbling stew and other riches is also true in the psyche, but may have to work through some of the shadow to get to the gold. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, as you know, my book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, was published in May of 2021 by Sounds True. And since it's been published, I've been feeling most excited and grateful reading the reviews for the book on Amazon and Goodreads. It makes me realize that this journey, which began as a challenging personal inquiry for me, has become a real healing force for many. Motherhood won the Parenting and Family category of the Best Book Awards this year through the American Book Fest, which has been exciting too. But what really feels nourishing to me as an author is hearing what's happening on the ground in people's hearts. And so many people have written to me on email or on social media and let me know how much the book has meant to them. And there's just nothing more gratifying than that, than to hear that the book has meant so much to so many people. So Motherhood is available wherever books are sold in paperback, ebook, and audio formats. And I hope everyone who's meant to dive into the well of its lessons can do so. And I so appreciate hearing from people what they think of it. So keep the emails and the letters and the comments coming. They mean a lot to me. There's also a free course that's related to the book and a book excerpt on my author website, which is lisamarciano.com. And I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thank you for asking, Joseph. I'm just uh, so happy for you. And it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. (laughs) Yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Tessa. The analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be (laughs) missed (laughs) as having a life of its own, which is just what we want. That's Mm. right. Well, 
We just ended talking about gifts from the unconscious, and one of the ways that we get gifts from the unconscious is through our dreams. And we'd like to invite you to uh, share your dream with us for possible interpretation on the podcast. You can do so by going to thisjungianlife.com, and you'll see a button right at the top of the page. Give us your dream, and we promise that we will treat it reverently. While you're on our website, you might also want to take a look at Dream School. Dream School is our 12-month program that takes Jung's way of working with dreams, breaks it down into a workable stepwise methodology, and helps you to access the wisdom of your dreams. So we hope you'll take a look at it and consider joining us. Today's dreamer is a 22-year-old woman who works in retail. And here's the dream. My cousin and I were in a fast food restaurant. There was a bar at the front where the workers worked behind the tills. We sat and ate the most disgusting food at the bar and watched the workers rush around. I thought to myself that this was a very unpleasant experience, watching people in a minimum wage job make disgusting food. Who would think to put stools at the checkout point? A man and his wife appeared on the stools beside us. He gave us a creepy smile, then sneakily grabbed my cousin's butt. She looked at me and whispered what just happened. I screamed at the man, saying something like, Did you just sexually assault my cousin? Everyone in the restaurant looked at us. It felt threatening. He didn't expect me to speak up. I threw my burger down, grabbed my cousin, and left. Something may have happened in between these scenes that I don't quite remember, but I know my cousin and I ended up in a police car with two policemen. We told them what had happened in the fast food restaurant, and they asked for a description of the guy. We realized that the guy had followed us to where the police car was. The officers knew him and told us to stay in the car for safety. They drove us to a safe house, which was a small, one-story, decrepit-looking building. Inside, the curtains were old, maybe from the 70s, and falling off the window. The place felt rotten and unpleasant. The cops said we'd be safe here. They were also staying here. I think they were in some sort of trouble. I looked out the window at the small garden, which reminded me a lot of my Nana's backyard garden, which was surrounded by neighbors and a nice community. And for context, she notes, I recently created my own self-help club, a support group on Zoom to discuss mental health and how to live a happier life. The feelings in the dream were disgust, anger, powerfulness, more disgust, then the feeling of remembering a pleasant memory. And finally, she notes, I was sexually assaulted and went to therapy to get a lot of it off my chest and I am still surprised at how much therapy changed my life. Sometimes I try to remember the sexual assault as not that bad. Then I see how physical symptoms have been relieved ever since I opened up about it. I'm not sure which mindset to keep. I can't live in anger, but I also can't live in denial. Also, my Nana passed away when I was nine. I used to write short stories growing up with her house as the setting. It is always in my mind. You know where I start with this dream is with the feeling evoked in me for the dreamer about her history of sexual assault. And, of course, how devastating that is. What ripple effects, so to speak, it has in the psyche of of anybody who has experience this and that it you know it places this dream in the context of what happened to her and the dream maker and the unconscious uh working working through it still and i think if we had this dreamer in the room with any one of us i think be- before we even considered the dream we might be considering this if it was the first time she had mentioned it uh, to us in therapy. 
you know, it, it strikes me that she's in this place of healing from this mm -hmm. uh, terrible thing where she's done a fair bit of work about it and she's um, opened up and, and she has experienced a real sort of release. And now she's wondering how to move forward. And in the comments section, she raises something that I would think is a kind of false dichotomy between remaining in anger or remaining in denial. And it seems to me that she's at this very particular place in recovery from something like this, where we are faced with just this choice. But in some sense, it's a false choice because we can remain conscious of what happened to us and how it has affected us and also move beyond constant vigilance and anger. Not an easy thing to do, but I think the dream is possibly speaking into this dilemma because it's wonderful that she goes outside and finds the policeman and the policemen listen to her and the policemen are aware of the danger of this guy, but the policemen take her to a safe house that is rotting. It's terribly decrepit. And the policemen are kind of hiding with her too. They're in some sort of trouble. So the safe place is really kind of like going into a sort of bunker mentality. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep myself safe by locking myself away in this kind of decrepit state of mind. And it seems to me that in a way this is related to our topic today, because if you've experienced an assault and it's broken your trust in the world, how do you go back out and just enjoy being at the restaurant? How do you let down your vigilance and welcome the world back in? I really like what you've said, Lisa, the, the false dichotomy that seems to be in, in the dreamer between being gripped by a, by this past experience or having to deny it. But I think the dream, uh, as she has written it down, also points to the third possibility that I'm sure therapy helped with, which is just the feelings. That what's going on in her are these feelings of disgusting food. It's an unpleasant experience. Again, disgusting food. The man and his wife gives him a creepy smile, sneakily gaps, uh, grabs uh, the, her cousin. Um, it felt threatening. Things are rotten, decrepit, unpleasant. And, and just to honor those as feeling states that can be felt without having to go into either denial or, or being stuck in it. I'm also thinking about how this dream ends, and I'm thinking about it in two ways. At the very end, after all this happens, I looked out the window at the small garden, which reminded me of my Nana's back garden, surrounded by neighbors in a nice community. Now, that's a memory from uh, up until she was nine years old when her grandmother died. And I'm thinking about how um, in some of the therapeutic modalities like EMDR and eye movement kind of uh, therapeutic technique, uh, that one of the things that they ask you to do is to hold in your mind a safe place, that when things become overwhelming or seem threatening, you can go to your self place, safe place, and, uh, and self place. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, whether there's another aspect to that too, but I'm, it feels safe it's in nature. It's the grandmother, uh, the positive mother, uh, surrounded by neighbors in a nice community. And I wonder if that is the telos here of the dream of here is the goodness. And you tasted that, you experienced it, you have memories and ability to visualize it. And that's there too in the psyche. What's coming up for me in the dream? that resonates with everything the two of you have said is the fairy tale Alalera. So in that fairy tale, Alalera is the daughter of a king, and the king turns an incestuous eye upon her, which is horrifying and frightening. 
she flees. And as she learns how to survive in the forest, she covers herself in animal pelts and moves into a very instinctive state. She is captured by a neighboring prince who mistakes her for some kind of exotic animal. When it becomes clear that she's human, she's given a job in the kitchen, and she creates these miraculous dishes, this food, which gains the attention of the king and the prince. When she's brought forward into conversation, she crouches down and says, I'm not good for anything but throwing a boot at my head. Don't look at me. Don't talk to me. She's kind of dismissed, and she remains in the kitchen and continues to cook food. Sometimes she'll slip a golden ring into the food, and mysteriously the prince will find this. And eventually what happens is the prince is able to hold Alalera in this conversation, to hold her to this determination that she be revealed. She goes through a tremendous amount of distress and anger and tumult, and it's eventually revealed that underneath all of these pelts, she's a beautiful, worthy, talented um, woman. And she recognizes that in herself, as does the court that she is now in. So when I think about this dream, and I think about the dream ego carrying this wound into the psyche, she's in this place where everything feels disgusting, the food is disgusting. The father figure in the dream is disgusting and worthy of rage. Just like Elalera, she, she covers herself in a kind of instinctive, protective rage that also encapsulates her. And as she yields to this instinctive rage, she, like Elalera, finds herself in this diminished and rotting safe house, that the way that the place that we flee to when we have been injured can often be greatly diminished, in part because of the shame that we've internalized and don't feel that we're worth anything but a boot to the head, like Alalera is. Sometimes we hide out in a diminished self-created circumstance so that we don't get attention because we associate attention with being preyed upon. So if I make myself look um, disheveled, if I kind of lead a life that feels like or looks like a rotting curtain, then no one's going to be interested. No one's going to move towards me and I don't have to risk something terrible and painful happening to me. So I feel like we are in the beginning of the fairy tale of Alalera, where the stage has been set with injury and rage and rotting curtains. And there's a whole other leg of the story that remains to be seen, which could involve this renewal of the inner animus figure, a kind of redemption of the inner masculine that can partner with the dreamer and lead her eventually back to her true creative state prior to being sidetracked by this trauma. Yeah, that was really well said, Joseph. I think that was a, a beautiful amplification of the dream. And, and as per your point, uh, the challenge, I think, is for the dreamer to allow herself to be able to be seen again so that she doesn't have to hide in the decrepit safe house. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.